Hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. I am your host, Bo Ramsdell, uh, joined shortly by Jerry Cortez, a.k.a. Mr. Venom, for our discussion of Psycho 2. Uh, so thanks, uh, first of all, for everyone who has turned out for the first episode, as well as some of the bonus stuff we've been doing. I really appreciate the feedback I've been getting. It's been great. Um, be sure, if you are listening to this and enjoying this, uh, please leave a rating and review for the show on the podcatcher of your choice. That is specifically helpful if you are a, an iTunes subscriber. That makes a world of difference over there. So, again, uh, I, I appreciate it. It's a brand new show. Uh, this is a real ground up endeavor. So, uh, again, if you're listening to this and you're enjoying it and you have an iTunes account, it would be terrific if you could leave a rating and review over there. Um, so as you're listening to this, not only, uh, will the first episode have dropped, but you should have the first episode of found footage fool, uh, which is my kind of bite sized look at some found footage movies. And there's going to be more of that coming soon. Obviously, Psycho 3 will be dropping a week from today. Sinister Sundays, which is the uh, live stream that we do Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 o'clock Central Time, on YouTube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts, uh, was especially fun this past Sunday. So uh, please, if you can, uh, make it to that. Uh, join us for that. Uh, it's really interactive, and that's one of the things, as I've said about this show before, I want it to be very interactive, and it has been so far, and uh, I really appreciate that. Um, you can find me, if you would like to interact, speaking of, at uh, Dark Parade Pod on Twitter. You can also find the Facebook group uh, for the Dark Parade. Just search for the Dark Parade. And I think it's uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Dark Parade will get you there as well. And I'm very active there as well. Um, Facebook, of course, a giant cesspool. But uh, our little corner of it is really fun. It's, uh, it, it's been great to kind of talk about horror movies and share uh, pictures of bears and, <laughs> and uh, stories of dolphin sex. It's a, just a good time. So feel free to drive by and say hey there. And I think that's it. So there are more coming soon, of course. But without further ado, uh, that's enough out of me. Let's get to a really interesting conversation about Psycho 2, which is a, a sequel that we described as being much maligned. But uh, it is imperfect, I would say, but I think you'll hear in our discussion that we also have a lot of time for it. So um, that's it for now, and uh, enjoy the conversation, and welcome, as always, to the Dark Parade. All right, once again, we are joined by the estimable Mr. Venom, a.k.a. Jerry Cortez, uh, I'm going to read a list of things that you do, and and you tell me what is incorrect. So we've got no more room in hell. Mm -hmm. We've got fresh cuts, which is the the new movie stuff. Mm -hmm. We've got creature comforts, which is the new show, all about creature features. Yes, sir. We've got in the mic of madness. Mm -hmm. We've got It's Not Horror, Okay. Mm hmm And then uh, on the, the Legion podcast, we've got Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. That's it. <laughs> I, look, the, and by the way, folks, there are links to all this. If you go to the, the post for this uh, episode, you can get links to all of that stuff. Um, good Lord, you're a busy man, sir. Oh, uh, I mean, first of all, greetings and salutations, my friends, and of course the the esteemed Bo. Um, I, I I do this to myself every October. I mean, obviously, I, I have the six shows that I have all year, but then no more room in hell being like my hardest hitting horror podcast. Uh, we always have like extra episodes in October. We'll do a movie commentary with a couple of guests. And then we'll just do like an extra episode of like, you know, whatever random Halloween related topic that we can think of. So um, at last count, I am scheduled for 21 podcasts in the month of October. And 
every year as October approaches, it's like, okay, I'm not going to do it that to myself this year. I'm not going to do it to myself this year, but I, it's just, I, it's so hard for me to say no. Uh, you know, when someone is good enough to invite me to their show that I'm just like, hell yeah, I'll do it. And you know, uh, I, st- I enjoy every second of it. Don't get me wrong, but the, the schedule, uh, uh you know, uh, between the shows, the movie watching, the prep, I mean, you haven't known me very long, but I, I'm sure you figured out that, you know, I try to do as much prep as I can. Um, and unfortunately because it's October and my time is kind of thin, or my available time is kind of thin. Uh, I, I'm just not able to put my A game on every single uh, appearance that I make. But I, I still enjoy every single second of these uh, spots, be they on my shows or guest spots on other shows. But yeah, um, at the end of every October, I take a deep breath and uh, realize that, yay, I can start watching cartoons again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I'm in the same boat where I'm looking forward to not quite the end of October because I should in theory be done with most of the recording pre Halloween for Mm -hmm. all of the last week of Halloween. So, but I, but I I totally agree. I'm in the same boat as far as like, Oh yeah, I can actually start just watching some stuff that isn't for a show I'm doing just for my own stupid pleasure. And, (laughs) um, but yeah. And I, as always, I appreciate the time. You're the best guest we've ever had on the show. In fairness, <laughs> only guest. But uh, that'll change uh, next week when we we have Dan Chase here for Psycho 3. Um, nice. But it, it's been a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, like I said, I was very excited and pleased with the conversation we had about Psycho. I'm really excited to talk about Psycho 2. And at the risk of uh, diving in to the deep end first i this is something that when we talked about this it's kind of at one time at least was a much maligned sequel to psycho Mm -hmm. and that seems to be shifting yes greatly and and i and i think that's right um but we'll we'll get into some of the deeper stuff in a minute but first let's let's just kind of talk about what what this movie is uh, which is it's it's at twenty three years after the events of Psycho, and and when last we left our hero Cherry, <laughs> uh, Norman Bates was no longer Norman Bates. He was fully mother locked away in an institution. And this movie starts off in a you know basically a hearing for Norman Bates to determine his status as a crazy person. <laughs> Mm-hmm. After a certain scene, of course, that kind of opens up the festivities. For sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm still kind of on the fence on the inclusion of uh, the famous shower scene at the start of Psycho 2. It's it's one of those things that, yes, I understand this is a, this is a sequel 23 years after the original. So it's valid to do some kind of wrap up uh, type, you know, set piece. But this is literally just the shower scene at the start. And sometimes as I'm watching the film, I feel like they're doing themselves a disservice because they're literally taking one of the greatest scenes in cinematic history, putting it in the front of their movie. And then we get to watch the rest of the movie and realize none of this is as good as uh, the shower scene that we watched at the beginning. So it's almost like they're setting themselves up for failure. But, you know, like I said, because of the time in between the two chapters, I, you know, I'm not going to argue too much about it, but I'm still on the fence on whether I agree or disagree with that decision. Let me give you a terrible example of (laughs) how this is a bad idea. So years ago, I got uh, free tickets to go see Sting and Annie Lennox. Mm -hmm. And the way that it worked was they like each of them would perform. I think sting went first and then they kind of come together at the end, but there was an opening act for both of them. Uh, and it wasn't just a dentist office. No, (laughs) as, as the acts would suggest, no, it was like, it was a guy who was trying to establish a solo career, but he had worked for sting and also, or like not worked for him. He wasn't like a grip. He, he, he was a, a musician 
in one of Sting's touring bands and had also co-written the song Shape of My Heart. Hmm. And so he, as he's telling this story, he says, so to help me sing, Shape of My Heart is the co-writer of the song, Sting. And so second song of the opening act of this concert, out comes Sting to sing Shape of My Heart with this guy. They finish the song. Sting is like, okay, I'll be back in a little bit. See everybody later. <laughs> and he takes off. Could not have given a shit less about anything else that this guy did for the rest of his opening act. Because like he had, he'd opened with a showstopper. You know? Yeah. And uh, uh, That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seemed really strange to me. Uh, but also, I think, uh, I think everyone's just a little jealous of the fact that I saw Sting and Annie Lennox. That's really the takeaway of the story. Oh, yeah. I'm a little green over here myself. Um, in fairness, Annie Lennox, amazing. What, oh, I'm sure. What a voice. Oh, yeah. Great pedigree. Yeah. Haven't seen either of those uh, performers live, but I would imagine that uh, they would put on a really good show. Uh, Sting did Demolition Man, which kind of ruled. Wow. So, yeah. Right. I was really surprised that that popped up. I was like, okay, if that's what we're doing, that's what we're doing. And I'm not complaining. Anyway, enough of my Sting and Annie Lennox bragging. Um, so, yeah, but you're right. The point of all that was it, it's tough to come off of the shower scene and then expect any anything else in the movie to live up to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I think there's one scene that kind of comes close for me because of how the performance is in the scene. But, yeah, so after that we go to this hearing. Norman Bates is... Uh, basically the the argument is he has spent 23 years in an institution he was never accused of murder directly the, he ended up uh being charged uh, with murder by reason of insanity and spent the you know much of his adult life in this institution and they're saying hey look he he understands what happened he knows that his mother is dead now <laughs> Um, so he's ready to be released back into the public. Um, thanks to the good work of his doctor as played by Robert Loggia, who is always welcome as far as I'm concerned in a movie. Oh, absolutely. And so they, they, the judge announces like, okay, we, we believe he is now mentally sound, but Lila Crane is in the, in the crowd and as listeners may recall, when last we saw Lila Crane, she was uh, discovering the body in the fruit cellar and being attacked by Norman Bates. And mm-hmm. more than anything, like she, she's there for justice for her sister. It's a little... I, I question the performance there. Like, I, listen, I've never had a family member brutally murdered before, so I, I don't know the emotions that Lila crane who is now lila loomis is uh really going through um but it just feels like after 23 years to go through um the performance that she puts on in the courtroom and then the eventual um you know uh, acting out of her plan that you know we're, we'll obviously hear about for the rest of the film it just feels like this movie has a strong theme of forgiveness and lack thereof and I, fe- I almost feel like Lila, even though she's the sympathetic victim, I-, I just feel like she's one of the most guilty people in this film once once it's all said and done. Um, even though, you know, for all intents and purposes, maybe she actually didn't kill anyone or, or uh, re- you know, through her actions result in someone dying. But just this sheer... Um, lack of forgiveness on her part it just is absolutely her downfall um i was watching a youtube video earlier today where they were talking about a proverb from the book of matthew where they talk about how god is unwilling to forgive your sins if you are unfil- unwilling to forgive the sins of others while you're on earth and i i found that quite moving to to think about i'm not a religious person as i'm sure we already discussed but um you know to 
to see that written out on the screen and then to think about Lila's motivation throughout the film, it, it really kind of makes her a heel. And I don't really want to think about her that way, you know, cause she is ultimately, ultimately she's a victim. We have no idea what the knowledge of Norman Bates killing her sister does to someone, uh, someone's psyche, you know, uh, you know, she could be completely broken mentally and uh, throughout the film, I think she kind of proves that she is. But it's kind of hard to look at her like I'm again, I'm kind of on the fence on whether I look at her as a sympathetic victim or an aggressive villain. And I, after this many watches, at least a dozen watches of this film, I'm still on the fence. It's like I want to be the kind, caring human being I'm supposed to be and feel bad for this woman who lost a family member. But at the same time, I just look at her as like you're the catalyst of all of this. And if, if you could have just found the power to forgive, uh, you know, so many more people would be alive right now. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a weird dichotomy. Yeah. And you're right, though, that a lot of these characters exhibit that they're, you know, it's it sort of when do they cross that meridian of being able to sort of move on from a tragedy mm -hmm. or they're just frozen by it. And and Lila certainly is waving this petition around. Like, I've got, you know, hundreds of signatures saying that this guy ought to be uh, locked up. And the judge, I always like it when a judge is like, order, order, you know, <laughs> to, tell that woman to shut up. And and that's essentially what happens. And uh, and and so he's released. There's a moment where outside the courtroom when Lila tells Robert Lozier, like, I hope you're happy. Doesn't even address Norman. Uh, just tells Robert Lozier, like, I I hope that you're happy that you have released this killer on the loose again. Yeah, she doesn't even look at Norman as a human being at this point. Like, like I said, her complete lack of forgiveness has completely clouded her to the point, like you said, she's only addressing... Uh, you know, her, his psychiatrist, when it's like he's standing right there, look at him and talk to him. I understand, you know, the, the horrible image that must be in your head, even though you didn't witness the crime. I'm sure it's been described to you, you know, by police back in 1960. So I'm sure there's horrible images in her head of Norman killing her sister. But uh, she she just completely l lost the uh, uh the ability to see Norman as a human being. And that's, that's almost as bad as anything as almost anything Norman does in this movie. Yeah. And that's the thing about this film is that Norman Bates does not rack up a body count. He is mm -hmm. largely a, a sympathetic character. It's something that, uh, you know, Tom Holland talked about that, you know, before you know that Norman Bates is the killer in the original psycho, then like the movie is geared to you having this sense of sympathy for him even when he's covering up murders for his mother you sort of understand why he's doing it up until the reveal of like oh no he's been doing this all along and so holland wanted to do essentially the same thing with this movie which is to portray norman bates as a sympathetic character it, it's just that he's more sympathetic in this scenario because he's actually trying to be a decent person uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to give him credit for that. I mean, despite the fact that he's obviously not 100% cured, uh, at the very least, hopefully they got the killing streak out of him, which I think they effectively did. I don't think Norman at any point would have continued those activities. Obviously, he's always going to have, you know, psychological issues. He's always going to have mother issues. Um, but, yeah, he, he makes a genuine effort to... Uh, rehabilitate himself in this one and yeah i mean there, there are multiple moments in the movie where i legitimately feel awful for him when he's in the kitchen practically crying on the table because he's thinking he thinks it's happening again i mean that's heartbreaking yeah yeah and so after all of this uh, court business goes down then norman decides he's going to move back into the family home and which has been empty but taken care of and the motel meanwhile has been run by Dennis Franz <laughs> which is never what you want no 
<laughs> yeah, they definitely set up Mr. Tooney as, uh, you know, quite the character, quite the miscreant, if you will. Um, and he plays it well, ultimately. I mean, I, I like Dennis Franz, honestly, but here, I mean, he shines as a scumbag, and <laughs> it's, a, it's a joy to watch. <laughs> yeah, he is one of cinema's greatest scumbags is probably the best word for it. <laughs> and and he's he's so good as a reprehensible human being here. Um but yeah, so Norman goes back to his place. The other uh the other thing in play here is that he's gotten a job at a local diner. And and so that's sort of his rehabilitation even though his his doc, Dr. Raymond, uh Robert Loja's character is like Norman, you shouldn't go back to this hotel. It's a really bad idea. <laughs> and Norman's like, no, no, no. I'm gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. This is my home. I'm gonna be cool. And so he, there's that great scene when he goes in for the, to the house for the first time, and it's, you know, it it is a house that is filled with bad memories for for Norman. It's a it, in in fairness to Doctor Raymond, it is an awful idea for him to move back into this house honestly in the real world i'm pretty sure a psychiatrist would have had a court order telling him okay i'm not letting you if you want to be released from this mental institution you cannot go back to the hotel for at least some period of time that can convince us that you can live in that house effectively because i mean what what what, what the psychiatrist and others might not be thinking about is that in Norman's mind, he's never lived in that house alone. His mother was always with him. They were always conversing. So, you know, it was it was like having, you know, a roommate. Now, this is the first time that he legitimately is and feels alone in this house. And I just don't think that a competent psychiatrist would have allowed that to happen, at least not the day he's released, you know? Right. <laughs> Let's take you immediately from the hospital where you're being treated for the psychotic break that you've had and take you right back into the cauldron where the psychotic break was forged. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what happens. And uh, so, but it is a, a, a fun scene of him, it, b both uh, seeing Norman Bates going home, but also as the audience kind of going back into, you know, mother's house and, seeing all the things that we're familiar with as people who have seen the movie psycho and it, it's fun it's it's fun to go home in this movie to see all of that stuff come to life again yeah it, it definitely reminded me of the original trailer for the first psycho with uh, with mr hitchcock giving us a tour of the house except this time we you know we already know what every room is so you know we don't need mr hitchcock kind of walking us through but i can still hear his voice during that scene as norman is walking through the house i still hear hitchcock go and this is mother's room you know it's just yeah it's so great this is the staircase where he came tumbling oh i just can't even talk yeah it's <laughs> it's so good and so it Norman is staying uh, at the house and then the, the local diner where he works. We first meet uh, a character that seems incidental initially, a, a lady named Emma Spool. Mm -hmm. And also working there, uh, aside from the gruff cook, who is a, a, the prototypical diner cook. <laughs> of, you know. They literally... They could have cast Vic Tyback in there and just called it Mel's Diner. It A hundred percent. And yeah, cigarette hanging out of his mouth constantly on the griddle and whatnot. And also in the mix is a new waitress there uh, who is calling herself Mary Samuels. Hmm. <laughs> right. Where does that? That sounds somewhat familiar. I don't know why. Honestly, though, 20 years, 23 years after the fact, I... I bet you a lot of people in the audience didn't catch it. The hardcore Psycho fans, obviously, are the hardcore Hitchcock fans. You know, people who probably went back and rewatched the original before going to see part two back in 83. Um, that, to me, that line feels like it's service for, you know, the hardcores who are paying attention. Yeah, and, and it's very similar to Marion Crane kind of doing her shtick in the original Psycho of, of borrowing the name of people that she knows are sam and you know so forth so yeah so the, it is very much a callback to that she is uh being a bit clumsy 
And there's a, a really nice moment where Norman Bates says, uh, when she drops some shit and the cook is getting on her case and Norman Bates says, oh, no, no, that was my fault. I did that. Don't don't yell at her. And later she asks him, why did you do that? And he says, well, because I, I thought he would be less angry at me than you. Yeah. I mean, honorable at the least. I mean, someone that he literally just met and he's defending them. That that just kind of shows you uh, the overall attitude Norman is carrying now. He's like, as we've already said multiple times, he's making a legitimate effort to reacclimate himself uh, to, you know, normal public life. And that's a great first step. It's a great way to make friends, a uh, great way to build trust. So, yeah, he, he's, he's on the right path at this point. Yeah, it's... Is it in this scene, too, where they give him a knife for the first time and tell him to cut up some lettuce? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's that hesitation of, like, are you sure you want to give me a knife? All right. Uh, I'm really good with it. And yeah, exactly. Especially considering everyone in the restaurant knows who he is. Like, this isn't some secretive employment or, or that he changed his name. Everyone literally knows that is Norman Bates, the Norman Bates from the Bates Motel. So... Yeah, the fact that people are so willing to offer him sharp weapons is maybe a little surprising, but he is, you know, a, a, a kitchen, a chef's assistant, cook's assistant, whatever you want to call him. So I, it makes sense that he's going to have to, at some point, handle one. But literally 30 seconds after he walks in the kitchen, hey, grab that knife and chop up some lettuce for me. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I really like that moment a lot uh, mm -hmm. where he like takes that tentative slice and then starts to get into it <laughs> um it becomes a salad shooter of his own and <laughs> and on the back end of this day at work he ends up uh having a conversation with meg tilly's character mary samuels who says uh hey my boyfriend threw me out and again norman bates being sort of chivalrous in the moment says hey i own a motel you want to come stay there because it's a motel there's places for you to stay there and um and she's like why are you doing this for me mm -hmm. and he's like nah i just you know I, I you need help i've got the space i just want to help you yeah norman is trying to be overly nice since he hasn't been a part of society for 23 years um i don't think he realizes that people that are that nice to total strangers are sometimes kind of looked at sideways like you know what what's your game what are you getting at what do you you know what do you want from me um but obviously as the viewer we know he legitimately feels this way he wants to help as many people as he can and you know he sees mary as a sympathetic character that's having a, a rough time a rough go of it he has the means to help her out by at least giving her a roof over her head so yeah uh you know again a uh, very admirable just it, it but it but it makes sense that people are suspicious of it especially in this society for sure mm. and so they head back to the motel where again a, a nice little touch i like is that it's raining when they get there uh much like it was when marion arrived <laughs> for the first time mm -hmm. but there's a nice moment where he says oh we almost made it you know, we all, we almost made it before the rain came in, and he's just being a nice guy. And then he's going to give her a room, but then realizes that Toomey, aka Dennis Franz, is essentially running, if not a by the hour kind of motel. It's the mm. kind of place where he's renting out all these rooms for like teenagers and the locals to come party and do drugs and have sex and that kind of thing it's just a seedy motel on the edge of town yep and so he uh he fires too he's like this is it you're out of here come tomorrow i want you gone and <laughs> it tells mary samuels look uh it's probably not great if you stay in one of the rooms why don't you come stay in the big house there's all kinds of room there and and so she follows him up to the house. Uh, there's a whole, I, I get it, just a, a, a scene I dearly love where they're making sandwiches. <laughs> and she says, hey, do you have a knife? And he's like, nope, nope, no knife here. Not, <laughs> not me. And there's, uh, he, when he says, uh, I just moved back in, I don't have any cutlery. 
Yeah, why did he stutter on that word? That was weird. <laughs> yeah, it, it's something that uh, Anthony Perkins in an interview said when he was doing auditions with a number of the women who were auditioning for Mary Samuels. It was something that he, he hit upon there and really liked it. That Because there's a little bit of a, a stutter in some of his lines in the original Psycho. And, and the way that Perkins describes it is he didn't really intend it. It's just that he seemed to fall back into that character so easily that it just came out as part of the audition. Those damn method actors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Anthony Perkins uh, killed 19 people, as we know. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, but it, it, it was a really fun conversation that, that he was having about being norman bates and there there was a whole thing where uh, the the interviewer asked him if playing norman bates was good or bad for his career and he said well it was good in the sense that when i walked down the street people didn't say hey there's that guy that i think i know from something <laughs> he said everyone knew who i was the downside is everyone knew i was norman bates yep and that's what you get for being an amazing actor in a great role. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you look at the way some actors are treated even today. It's like there are some people out there that still can't separate the craft from the art or the artist from the art, if you will. Um, you hear stories all the time of actors catching hate on the street because they play a villain. Uh, you know, on a TV show or a movie or whatever. And I, so the point is, I could imagine what that must have been like in 1960. Like, people must have literally thought that he was psychotic and probably crossed the street when they saw him coming. Oh, for sure. You know, I mean, I'm, there are people who are terrified of Anthony Hopkins because he was in Silence of the Lambs and mm -hmm. just because he played that role so well. Or, or almost the inverse of that is something like uh, a Robert England who... Yeah is a pretty quiet, you know, character actor for much of his career mm -hmm. until Nightmare on Elm Street. And then that's all anyone can think of him as. And, yep. you know, and it's great for him. I mean, he, he, he leaned into it in a way that Anthony Perkins did not. Uh, Anthony Perkins, for a number of years between Psycho and Psycho 2, wanted to distance himself from Psycho as much as he could. Yeah, to the point that he actually left the country for five years. Uh, right after the release of, maybe not right after the release of Psycho, but right around like a year after the release of Psycho, he actually moved to France and did a couple of pictures out there, not returning uh, to California until 1965. So yeah, that's like four or five years that he just got away from Hollywood, not just Norman Bates, but Hollywood. So I mean, that that tells you a lot about what he probably had to go through that you know those six months to a year after the release of psycho yeah and i'm sure that it was frustrating as an actor because he'd been sort of a romantic leading man mm -hmm. prior to psycho and then psycho comes along and i'm sure that everyone just wanted him to play a version of norman bates yeah. and and as an actor i understand as a creative individual that's not what you want to do your whole life but um, you know, he certainly seemed to make peace with it later, yeah. for sure. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually surprised that he still ended up getting pigeonholed or typecast, if you will, <laughs> into that role. Because it's like Norman Bates isn't like a, writh like a wild, screaming, writhing maniac, you know? Yes, he killed, what, seven people back in, you know, 60 before, maybe more. Um but he was, you know, he was always meticulous. Yes, he had, you know, um, a split personality disorder, which obviously kind of affected his day to day activities. But he still was a very calm, cool, collective kind of psycho. So I was I was actually surprised that he didn't get more like villainous roles, but not necessarily like crazy villainous, like like, like let's say a Bond villain. Yeah, like I think I think he would have been a spectacular Bond villain. Um, you know, uh, 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 some kind of, you know, espionage story, a government, uh, you know, plot story, something along those lines. I feel like he could have played uh, like a deep cover bad guy really, really well. But somehow people watch Psycho and it's like they saw Charles Manson and 
I don't really understand it, but again, I wasn't here in 1960, so I can't really speak for those people. Right. And if I have a time machine, I'm not wasting it on that. That's true. <laughs> but but I, I agree with you 100% that, yeah, it. I think that he he's the kind of actor that you can sort of tell that there's something going on behind his eyes and mm -hmm. and he would have made an amazing villain for almost anything like a much more literate kind of villain yeah absolutely um, um uh what do you call it um the uh the, the sherlock holmes villain uh, i forgot moriarty yeah, yeah yeah hey, thank you i think he could have been a great moriarty depending on the production um, it, it, it's really too bad because like I said, it, it, it's funny because we see guys like Brad Pitt playing c complete psychos in a movie like 12 monkeys yet. He doesn't get typecast. You know, he, he still gets to be the heartthrob and do the action movies and everything else. But Anthony Perkins literally plays one of the most subdued psychos in cinematic history and he's typecast. So it, it's just really unfortunate, you know, wrong place, wrong time, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, after their sandwich conversation, <laughs> Mary uh, ends up staying there somewhat apparently reluctantly at first. And Norman's insistent to the point of being a little creepy about it, where he's mm -hmm. like, no, 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 I thought you were going to stay and you don't have anywhere else to go. And, and so finally she sort of relents, but also uh, I think this is the point too where he sort of reveals who he is. You know, like yeah. I'm I'm sure you, you heard that I'm that Norman Bates and you know, I killed my mother. And the, he, the way that he presents it of like I put some poison in her tea and <laughs> that that little head bob that he does to indicate the murder of his mother is really wonderful. I really like that a lot. Oh, it's great. It shows that he's kind of, he's come to terms with it. Like, it, it doesn't drive him mad anymore. He's he's come to terms with the fact that, yes, I killed my mother. I killed her lover. I killed multiple people. And humor is a great way to kind of deal with trauma. You know, we see it in horror films all the time. We get a scare. We get a laugh right after it. So to actually see Norman take a very incredibly dark situation and actually get to crack a smile about it I, I i found it very endearing yeah and so she ends up staying the night but she makes sure that she puts a chair in, in front of the door uh <laughs> to make sure that norman bates isn't going to creep up on her uh during the night and uh and so then we go back to the diner for a big scene there where uh, there's toomey um who is drunk when he shows up to you know yell about norman bates firing him and say you all know who this guy is he's a murderer um <laughs> and there's some business too where he's uh to quote gary Busey, somebody's playing poison pen pals with him by slipping notes on the wheel of the diner uh from mother saying like don't let that slut stay in my house yeah that was uh i i mean to this day i'm I, i'm assuming mary put those notes up there but man she is ninja like because i watch that scene meticulously and i just cannot see anyone uh mary walks by the spindle at one point but you don't see her raise her hand or anything so it, it's definitely smooth on her part very ninja like yeah and so he freaks out about the note, but when they go to look for it, there's no note there. And I think th you're, you're right. I think this is a Mary Samuels thing. Like, in theory, it could be Mrs. Spool, too. Valid. Yeah, very valid. Because, and or it could be both. It could be, you know, Mary put the note there and Mrs. Spool hit it. Uh, but probably it's Mary. Like the, none of that is ever made a hundred percent clear, but that's probably how it went down. And it's cool how they kind of throw a quick little line in there that kind of shows that Norman's memory isn't totally perfect because he claims vehemently that the note is still on the spindle, but we clearly see him take the note off of it. And then when he reads it, that's when he drops the basket into the deep fryer, dropping the note on the floor. But then later he 
like I said, very vehemently claims it's it should still be on the spindle. And it's like, no, dude, <laughs> you picked it up. <laughs> so, you know, th- this is where I start questioning, oh, no, is, is his psyche starting to break down already? I mean, we're only 20 minutes into the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, there are forces at work against him immediately. And to try to emphasize that schism in his personality. And he ends up uh, basically being sent home for the day after burning his boss's arb and (laughs) uh, accusing a drunk Toomey of of putting the note there and whatnot. And then we see, speaking of of Dennis Franz and and this scumbag Toomey, (laughs) he's packing up the motel and uh, or you know he's actually getting all his his stuff and and leaving mm-hmm. and is murdered uh at the motel by what appears to be mother yep and it's pretty in terms of comparing it to the original psycho like it's kind of gnarly it's a big gash a- across his face and whatnot oh yeah very effective yeah it's uh it's really good it's maybe my favorite kill of the movie um hmm. it, I, I could see that yeah just because it, it's sort of subtle and i think as, especially the the one later is not maybe and eh, maybe the make telly one but it, i i like this because it sort of rides that line between the exploitation tendencies of the slasher movies of the 80s but also being a little restrained Oh, the, definitely. I mean, considering it's 83, they definitely could have gone way more over the top. I mean, this is two years after the big slasher boom of 1981. So, yeah, they absolutely could have upped the gore, upped the blood. But the fact that they decided to show restraint, it's almost like a, a, a maybe a little nod of respect to Hitchcock. It's like, you know, we're not going to take your franchise and turn it into a gore fest, but we're still going to update the kills a little bit. And other than maybe one kill uh, later on in the movie, I, I think they're all great, not too over the top, not too, uh, you know, uh, fake looking or reliant on effects. So um, we'll get to that one kill that I'm sure we're all thinking of that. I know a lot of people love that kill and it is a great kill, but it, I, I have issues with it, which we'll get to later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that because I think you and I are probably going to agree on that. But it, it, this movie is very much like the whole reason Universal wanted to do this is because of the slasher boom. They wanted to make yep. a slasher movie. Yep. And originally it was supposed to just be a made for cable affair. <laughs> yeah, a TV movie starring Christopher Walken. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean that's crazy. All oh, it would be great, mother. Uh, it would be great. <laughs> the blood, mother. The blood. <laughs> yeah, that would be really fun. But it wasn't until they got Anthony Perkins on board that it became enough of a real project that it was like, Oh, okay, we're going to make this theatrically then. Uh, Mm -hmm. But yeah, there was, there is a world in which (laughs) that, you know, psycho two was a made for uh, a made for TV movie or made for cable. Like it still would have been kind of gross and gory, probably more so that like this, I think they probably went a little more bent more towards that sort of Hitchcockian restraint than they would have had it been Christopher Walken, you know, in a in a slasher film. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so um Toomey is now dead. Uh Mary ends up sort of moving in to the the house. Uh <laughs> And so the the stage is now set for the craziness to ensue, which happens pretty quickly. Like he starts hearing mother's voice coming from her bedroom. Uh, he starts, you know, finding like there were the notes, of course, uh, that that he finds. There's one under the telephone that he finds, uh, and when he first ventures into the bedroom mm, great scene yeah it's it's terrific like it, it it's 
And it's been set back up. Like, somebody has recreated... Because when we first see it, like, when Meg Tilly first looks at it, things are kind of, you know, leaned against walls and that kind of thing. It looks like a place that's been in disrepair. Or, if not disrepair, unused, certainly. Yeah. And But now when he goes back in, uh, it's it looks like Mother has been there all along. Yeah. And just before he goes into the bedroom, we get that one single shot of his son, Oz Perkins, playing a young Norman Bates, which, if anyone doesn't know, anyone listening to this show who doesn't know, shame on you. But yes, Oz Perkins is one of the great young horror directors around right now. Uh, He's done three features, and I love all three of them. I know one or two of them um, kind of are divisive because, you know, some people say they're a little slow. Uh, I myself love slow burns. So, you know, his slower movies are fun. His fantasy movie is great. So yeah, get on, get on the Oz Perkins bandwagon. Couldn't agree more. Uh, <laughs> you know, I have my preferences with those. I'm still sort mm-hmm. of a February fan at heart, but, uh, yeah, he's a, a really interesting director and clearly sort of has his father's sensibility in terms of direction, like very, european influenced mm-hmm. in, in a lot of ways so yeah he's he's his father's son to be sure <laughs> uh but yeah and so he keeps kind of chasing this sound uh up into the attic of the house and once inside he's locked inside the attic and we get maybe the best shot of the movie and, and worth mentioning this is shot by dean cundy Mm-hmm. who is uh, just a brilliant cinematographer, did a lot of work with uh, John Carpenter, of course, but has worked with mm-hmm. pretty much every big director around at this point. Yeah, he is uh, He is the main person responsible for that spectacular tracking shot at the start of Halloween 78. Uh, Carpenter wasn't even 100% sure he wanted to do that shot because of the difficulty of putting it together. But Cundy kind of talked him into it, and boom, we have a classic horror film opening. Yeah, and he, there's that kind of magic here where when Norman Bates is locked in the attic, we get a shot of him looking out the attic window, and the camera pulls back and moves along the eaves of the house and then points down, and you see this teenage couple sneaking into the cellar. <laughs> and they see that there's a, a female figure moving around inside. Once they get down there and they start making out, there's a full on, I am grabbing this woman's breast. Uh, it oh, is, yeah. It is third <laughs> was, base to be sure. He skipped first and second base, man. He just went right for the titty. <laughs> yeah, it's impressive. And so they see somebody moving around and get freaked out and the girl ends up escaping out the window that they came in. And as the guy is trying to get out, he gets stabbed to death in a scene. That's kind of not kind of, it is incredibly reminiscent of the shower sequence Yep, where there's a lot of quick edits and, and that kind of thing. Although you definitely see a little more insertion of the knife this time around. Oh, by far. (laughs) And it also has a really great, like, his fingertips dragging along the interior of this dirty window. Uh, It's pretty good. It's uh, like I said, I think I'm I'm partial to the Dennis Franz thing because it's so quick and it's really shocking and, and, and kind of brutal. Not that this isn't brutal, but it's really good. And again, not over the top. Yeah, no, very, uh, they definitely, uh, you know, kept it more subdued. You know, this this definitely is not like a Friday the Thirteenth style slasher by any stretch. Um, uh, I, I'm actually very happy with most of the kill scenes in this movie. Definitely, yeah, it, it's quite good. And so mm-hmm. it turns out this girl has fled Norman Bates' uh, cellar to tell the police, which is smart. And while she's informing the police of what happened in the basement. And the fruit cellar. Uh, Mary ends up finding Norman in the attic. And he's like, you're never going to believe this. My mother's back. Her bedroom is in perfect order again. And they go in there and it's returned to that state of disuse. Yep. And yeah, definitely. Uh, 
definitely the start of uh, Norman's at least outward breakdown. Obviously, by this point, we've already, as the audience, have already questioned his sanity at this point. But at but here is where it's kind of outward, where he's got another party telling him, "No, no, that's not what happened. You're 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 imagining things or whatever." And it, it, it's almost sad, like I said, because at this point, we're on board for Norman. We're on board for his rehabilitation. And every time, you know, something happens to him, some someone makes a phone call, someone messes with him in his own house. It, it's just you see the flakes of sanity coming off of his head. Oh, wow. I'm a metaphor master today. Um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> the- uh, but yeah, just uh, it, it's I, I found myself being sad throughout a lot of this film on this watch. Just really, you know when you see Norman making this effort, it's legitimately just um, emotional as hell. And, you know, the ending of the film is almost cathartic for people like us. And I'll explain that statement when we get to it. (laughs) Fair enough. Uh, Yeah. So uh, the sheriff shows up along with deputy Tom Holland, uh, which is fun. And uh, he's, you know, kind of the good old boy town sheriff and asking like, Hey, you know, this girl showed up and said that uh, somebody got murdered near a fruit cellar. You're not up to your old tricks, are you, Norman? Is it all right <laughs> if we have a look around? And uh, he's like, yeah, 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 you can come in. And M- Mary gives him an alibi and says, hey, there's no way he could have done anything because he and I were out for a walk. And the sheriff is like, are you sure about that? And she's like, yeah, totally. And Norman's like, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and and they go into the fruit cellar. Sure enough, it all looks fine. And the sheriff takes off. And Norman kind of gets pissed at her for lying to the police. Yeah, it's it's another sign of Norm's, Norman's rehabilitation. Like, he does not want to lie. There's He understands that the more you lie to police, that's going to pile up. And eventually, even if you're 100% innocent, you could still get arrested if there's enough doubt or enough suspicion that you're guilty of something. So, yeah, I, again, like I said, just so admirable of him to not want to lie at any level to the police and then gets upset at Mary. It's It's a great little scene. Yeah, and on the back end of it, he's he's telling her, like, I'm, I'm afraid that I've killed again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thing, the one saving grace is I was locked up in the attic. And Mary tells him, like, you weren't. When I found you in the attic, the door was unlocked. Mm-hmm. And dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so, so later that night, they one of the toilets backs up all bloody like Mm. and they find this bloody rag that's been stuffed into the toilet and this is further evidence for norman that he has killed someone that he killed it up he like had blacked out killed somebody cleaned it up and tried to flush this rag down and it's backed up and sure enough you know he is a murderer again Mm mm-hmm and Mary is the one who kind of comes to his defense is like, you, you did not do anything. I can guarantee you, you are innocent of this murder. I can't tell you why I know that. <laughs> yeah. She has an odd change of heart at like the weirdest times. Like I, I, I'm pretty sure that she, you know, once we kind of reveal what's going on, I'm pretty sure that she was never a hundred percent on board. I'm sure that she was being dragged into this by other parties uh, because, like I said, she turns so quickly. Like, you know, she could have sold Norman out right then and there and decides, no, he I, I see the effort that he's making, the legitimate effort to try to be a normal person. So I'm not going to condemn this man for something that I think my mother did. So blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. And well, this is about the point where we see Lila uh, in the the motel. Um, Mm -hmm. where Lila and Mary kind of have this conversation where you realize like, oh, they are actually in cahoots, I think is the technical term, the legal (laughs) term. (laughs) And they've been like Lila and, and Mary have been leaving some notes and making some phone calls for them. 
uh, Lila dressed as mother to uh, no, it was Mary who dressed up like mother to sit in the mm-hmm. window. Yep. So that Norman would think that uh, you know mother was back, and she also locked Norman in the attic. Um, and that they're basically like Lila's whole purpose here is to drive him over the edge again, not so that he'll murder, but so that he'll uh, essentially act in such an erratic way that they'll recommit him. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have to say this is one of my least favorite scenes in the film. I I feel like they, um, Tom Holland and Richard Franklin, I feel missed an opportunity to give us like a great reveal because ultimately all we get is Mary sitting in the lobby of a hotel and then boom, out of nowhere, Lila comes in and says, what are you doing here? People might see us together. And it's like, ah, oh, really? That's how, how that's how you're going to reveal your plot to the audience? I, I, I wasn't really happy with it. I, I felt like there was enough power and punch in that plot and that reveal that they could have done something a little bit more tension-filled. Maybe a scene where Mary potentially might be getting stalked. Uh, and, and then we see, like, you know, Lila dressed as Norma come out of the woodworks with a knife and Mary's like, oh, oh, it's just you or something. Like, I don't know. I, I'm no filmmaker, mind you. All I know is that I'm very unhappy with the reveal in this scene. Well, yeah, you're right, because it's just two people talking to each other about what's going on. It, it mm-hmm. sort of breaks the fundamental cinematic rule of, of show, don't tell yep. when you can. And this is very much a scene that tells instead of shows. Exactly, which is something that Hitchcock was incredibly against. So it, it let, that's why I'm questioning the decision from Franklin and Holland. Yeah, and both of whom are certainly fans of oh, yeah. uh, of Hitchcock and his body of work. And Richard Franklin is a student of, of Alfred Hitchcock. I visit him on mm-hmm. the set of Topaz, I think, is where he was on the, the set with with Mr. Hitchcock for the, that film. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least partially, and made a student of it, like directed the movie Road Games, which is very Hitchcockian. Uh, um, yeah, and- yeah. Franklin's done a lot of underrated genre picks. Like, I mean, I hear no one ever talk about Patrick, and I love Patrick. I adore that film. It's yeah. not like a ten out of ten by any stretch, but it speaks to me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, we won't talk about the sequel, but yeah, 1978's Patrick, I, I think, is a stellar film from Richard Franklin. Right, and has some very Alfred Hitchcock compositions uh, yep. in, in that film. Like it, Franklin was obsessed. I, I think the, his two were... I'm, I'm trying to think of the other one now. I know Alfred Hitchcock was one. I can't remember the other director. Might have been... Might have been Wells. Can't remember now. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, was a, a student of, of these filmmakers. And uh, so, yeah, it does feel especially clumsy. But... Also, it it allows Mary at the at the very least to say to Lila, y- "You don't know who Norman Bates is. Uh-huh. Like you think you do, but you don't really know who he is, and he's not capable of murder anymore." Uh-huh. Um, which <laughs> we'll find out. Maybe not. Well, so I think we're all capable of murder. I mean, we we all have our a line to not cross, but. I mean, I, I understand her point in that statement, yes. <laughs> and right, and she's saying, like, somebody is in that house, and if it's not me and it's not you, then there's somebody else at work here. Mm-hmm. Extra mystery. Yeah, and which I actually think is one of the strengths of this movie. I don't yeah. necessarily think the resolution is great, but I think the mystery itself is really good. Yeah, there there's there's a plot hole or two there in the you know, when we get the reveal there at the end of who's actually killing people here, uh, there's some issues I have with it. Um, overall, I've always enjoyed the film, so I, I don't really question it too much. But yeah, um, clumsy is a great word because yeah, with the reveal and even that final scene, it's like, eh, I don't think Hitchcock would have been ultra happy with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, there was a documentary I was watching about this that lands on it, and we believe Mr. Hitchcock would have been proud. I was like, eh, I don't know about that. Let's not overstate it. Um, exactly. Proud is a little strong, my right. friend. <laughs> uh, accepting, maybe? Uh, let's start there. Yeah. But, but, uh, but, yeah, so after this conversation, after we as the audience know 
okay, so Mary and Lila are in it together, but there's also this other element at work, and that could potentially be Norman, but likely not because Mary admits, like, I had him locked up in the attic when, if if a boy died in the cellar, it was not Norman Bates because I had him locked away. Yeah, and and they the, the sheriff throws a line in there that actually kind of throws a little bit of a wrench uh, into the works and, and kind of makes the viewer believe that it is Norman because he says that the surviving teenager described the killer as a tall person in a black dress. Yeah, uh, My friends, there is no one in this movie that's tall. Uh, I mean, the sheriff, yeah, but he's a big guy. Like, he's a big, chunky guy. Norman is about the only tall character in this movie. So as soon as that sheriff lets that line out, I think most of the audience is like, ah, oh, shit, he's back at it. <laughs> yeah, and... Right, I, I think that's a, a a little mishandled, or it's certainly a red herring. Yep. When it it feels a little unfair to the audience in some ways, but I also think the ultimate reveal is a little unfair. But, mm-hmm. um, at any rate, there's a really good scene that follows this where Mary, who is increasingly sympathetic to Norman Bates, is in uh I, Norman comes to her room. I think it is where um he's he's sort of doubting his sanity he's saying like i know i've seen my mother in this house and i can't tell if i'm starting to crack up or uh if this is really happening and there's a great bit where he says you know you remind me of of my mother a little bit in that or you, you you smell good you smell like grilled cheese sandwiches is what he says <laughs> toasted cheese sandwiches yeah. he loves those damn things <laughs> and she's like what and he's like no my mother when i was sick and my mother would bring me toasted cheese sandwiches and uh she's like well that's what you need to hang on to that's what you need to remember and he says i can't remember that because they took all the good things away from me all the good things i remember about my mother like they took that away when i was being treated and yeah that's that doesn't seem fair i mean ultimately you know it's still his mother yes she may have been you know domineering overbearing whatever adjective you want to go with but despite the neglect at the end of his life there had to be a lot of happy years in there and I think, I, uh, once again, I feel like the psychiatrist maybe did a little bit of a disservice to him by eliminating both the bad and the good memories. Because he's going to spend the rest of his life just wondering, like, you know, th- did I ever have good times with this woman that didn't involve toasted cheese sandwiches? But that's the only memory he has left. And, it, yeah, I don't like it very much. But what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, and there's uh, also something we haven't really talked about, but that's kind of going on in the background of all this is even with um, Mary, that there are moments where we get the, you know, the key, the the eye peeking through the uh, mm-hmm. the holes in the walls as she's showering and so forth. And, and the question is, is that Norman? Is it Lila? Um, I think the answer to that is, you know, the reveal at the end of the movie but it's yeah that seems to be the consensus but you know i i have my differing opinions as well (laughs) well yeah and it's something that i i find interesting about this movie is the film dances around norman's sexuality or certainly Mm -hmm. the way that he perceives mary And whether his interest in her is strictly chivalrous and I'm just here to be your friend and help you, or if he does have a, a sexual attraction to her. I think it I think it comes slowly. I, I think at first, yes, he was being honorable, he was just being a good friend. But I think right ar- I think that's kind of what the movie is going for. Like right around the time where he starts to hear his mother's voice, I think is kind of the moment where he starts to realize that he has sexual attraction for Mary. Uh, and that's just kicking in the old habit. As soon as he has a sexual attraction, mother is there to say, No, 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 not that slut, not my son. 
Yeah, because he asks her at one point, I think it's towards the end of the film, uh, which we're, we're not there yet, but yep. the he does ask her at one point, you know, she says, like, I care about you. And he says, is is that is that all it is? And mm-hmm. you're sort of baiting her into saying, like, no, I love you, Norman, you know. Um, and and that's also, again, I, I, I think you're right. I think this film is ultimately a tragedy. Mm-hmm. And part of it is that it's that Norman, you know, he flirts with happiness, but he's doomed never to truly have it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we then uh, Robert Loggia, God bless him, <laughs> figures out that, oh, Mary Samuels is Lila's daughter. And so he goes to Norman. He's like, listen here, Norman. I know you don't want to believe this, but Mary and Lila are in cahoots and they're trying to drive you crazy. And Norman is pretty insistent about like, no, 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 that may be true. But also my mother is fucking with me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really kind of telling um, the level of his psychosis at this point, because he's more willing to believe that his dead mother is back than a very plausible, you know, uh, scam, which which is explained to him word for word by a psychiatrist. But he still finds it easier to just believe that his mother is still alive. You know, again, another sad scene that, you know, every single thing that's being done to this poor guy is just, like I said, breaking down his, you know, mental health. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, I, I'm trying to, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but folks, I, I, like I said, on this watch, I just, I found myself to be so emotional and, and emotionally attached to Norman more than I ever have been in my life. And this last watch was definitely a different kind of experience for me as opposed to the first 10, 12 times I watched this film. So yeah, it, it hit me hard this time. Yeah. And the movie does aim for that like the the movie is trying to present norman bates mm-hmm. as sympathetic and it doesn't hurt that you have anthony perkins coming back to this role and being very sensitive like he's an open wound the entire movie mm-hmm. you know he is uh, a raw nerve what other euphemisms <laughs> can we use uh yeah i mean he is incredibly sensitive to what's going on around him and is very very much the tragic figure in that regard and so robert loggia is like listen norman what we're gonna do is we're gonna take you out to this cemetery and we're gonna dig up your mother i can't imagine how that could go wrong <laughs> i can't imagine how that can go right <laughs> <laughs> right right and so they that's what happens they drag about it and, and there's a great line where one of the deputies or something is like uh, how did how did this happen so fast? They're like, well, he said it was an emergency exhumation or something, um, which I would love to hear Robert Loja trying to push that through. Look, I I know this sounds crazy, but we got to dig this old lady up. There's just no getting around it. Otherwise, yeah, Norman Bates could kill again. I mean, because if he if he actually said that in court that we need to show him his dead mother, that's almost an admission of failure that he didn't actually cure Norman. Norman still has enough of, you know, the, the 1960 DNA in him that he could potentially go back to his old ways. So I couldn't imagine him in court trying to, you know, trying to convince a judge to give him the order to exhume that body because like i said it it feels like an admission of failure on his part yeah oh for sure and and so they dig up this body and sure enough there is a corpse in the casket Mm -hmm. and robert loji is like huh what do you say now norman and he's like yeah yeah yeah. i agree that mrs bates is in that casket i'm talking about my real mother that's who's doing yeah, that's he. He comes out of nowhere with that line. Like there, there is no indication, even an in, inclination of an idea that potentially he's adopted or that Norma is not his real mother. Just out of nowhere, he spits out that line. And the first time I heard that, it's like I, I didn't know how to take that. Is that is this just again his you know broken memories uh, kind of screwing with them? Or is he legitimately telling us the truth right now? Like I was, I was definitely uh, um, just 
uh, my my interest was heightened as soon as he uh, said that line. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah, well, and it's tough to say because he's he has been getting these phone calls, some of whom, some of which are certainly from Lila, but some of them we don't know. And and there are a couple that we're for sure like this is not Lila who's talking to him on the phone right now. But we don't know what this other voice is saying, and it could be that the idea was planted as said. We just don't know. But yeah, it's it, it was an interesting choice not using any of the audio from the other end of any of those phone calls, because um, I'm wondering how, considering Lila never met Norma Bates, I'm wondering how well was she able to imitate this woman, or was she not even trying? Was she just basically speaking in her own voice? But Norman just accepted it as his mother, or was she actually giving a good impression? But you know, at the same time, I it, it's not a vital thing it's not like i'm upset that they didn't include that audio i can understand why they didn't just to add to the mystery of it but yeah it's one of those things i'd be interested to hear yeah i agree i I would like to know just from the writerly point of view like just Mm -hmm. tell me i I don't need it in the movie necessarily but i I want like 10 minutes alone with tom holland there you go yeah (laughs) um but yeah so he he makes this pronouncement about well there's a real mother and robert loja is like look norman you, there's no record of you ever being adopted and, you know norma bates is your mother and then later norman ends up talking to mary who is you know basically relating to her like you're not gonna believe this mary they dug up my mother but it's not really my mother there's another mother <laughs> and she's like listen norman <laughs> We have been screwing with you. He's right. And I don't want any more part of this. Lila is is crazy in her own right. She won't stop. But I'm not going to participate in this anymore. But you have to understand that whatever it is that you're experiencing, it's Lila. It's my mother. There is no other mother <laughs> rolling around like Coraline. <laughs> yeah. Um this is, I don't know, uh, this is kind of a, a little bit of a trope. Even in 83, this was kind of a trope of the, not necessarily a horror trope, but just cinema in general of someone going undercover to infiltrate a group, a gang, you know, in this case, uh, you know, someone's personal life, but then developing feelings for that person and then deciding, no, no, I don't want any part of this anymore. But of course, by that time, it's too late. Um, like I said, a little bit of a tired trope, even in 83, but you know, for whatever it's worth, um, since I like the overall film so much, I'll, I'll go ahead and forgive it. (laughs) Yeah. And I think there is a thematic reason for this as well of, Mm -hmm. of Mary sort of bucking the desires of her mother to try to assert herself to some degree. And anyway, so Lila uh speaking of is in the fruit cellar later and is digging up a or not digging but like has uh the mother costume hidden under a a stone in the in the cellar Mm -hmm. and as she is getting her mother outfit to continue to harass norman bates out of the shadow steps mother (laughs) <laughs> and this is the murder probably both of us are, are in this camp where she just gets stabbed in the fucking face with this butcher knife and it goes like through her mouth out the back of her neck it is raw yeah um i i'm actually very very surprised that vera miles actually was okay with that scene you know, Vera Miles being kind of a veteran of Hollywood and, you know, having a long career, um, it doesn't seem like something that she would be willing to do. Usually it's younger actors who are willing to, you know, get decapitated or get dismembered in a horror film. Like, I, I remember even with um, uh, Fatal Attraction, uh, that, that was Glenn Close, right? Like, I remember uh, hearing stories on set of how she didn't, she didn't really like the fact that they were going to shoot her in the head. Like she, she was like, I don't know if I really want that image out there of me getting violently shot in the head. Obviously, the director and the writer were able to convince her that, yes, it's the effective ending that we need for this film. Uh, with this one, it's not the ending of the film. It's, it's a, just a very over the top kill. It is shocking. Um, 
it doesn't look great by today's standards. I mean, obviously in 83, if you see it in a theater without a rewind button, yeah, it, it's going to be effective. And it's going to look pretty good. But I definitely question the brutality of the kill. And then, like I said, just Vera Miles being okay with it. I'm wondering if she had to be convinced. Like maybe her her death was actually just supposed to be like a stabbing in the, in the midsection or whatever. But maybe they, she was talked into this scene because like I said, it's 83. We're in the middle of like the, the eighties slasher boom. And I, you know, th these are the kind of backstories I would be interested in. Um, you know, I know a lot of people maybe don't worry about what Vera miles is thinking about as she's taking a, a butcher knife to the mouth, but I, I definitely would question it. It just doesn't seem like something an established Hollywood actress is okay with doing. So yeah, just a thought. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that. And also, I think, you know, this is a character from the original film. And I my gut reaction to it is you have to treat that character with some degree of reverence, even though she's sort of the villain of the yeah. movie in a lot of ways. And I, you know, I don't have a problem with killing this character off. But I almost, uh, like, I would have been fine if this was off screen and you just find her under the coal later or something. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking um, it may not have been as gory or visceral, but I feel like it would have been more effective if Mary just found her later. Like, maybe during the final chase with Norman or whatever. Uh, you know, well, I mean, wh where she does eventually find her, actually, but... Um, I agree with you. I don't think this death needed to be on screen. I, I feel like it would have been more effective if Mary just found her during that chase. But, you know, again, choices, uh, you know, that Franklin and uh, Holland made. What are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. And I, you know, certainly of the time, like like we've been talking about, this was the mm -hmm. the heyday of slashers. And I'm sure that informed a lot of it. But it, it does seem like a real unfortunate decision. Yep. Um, so elsewhere jerry <laughs> the the police are dredging the swamp where uh norman bates is known to dump some cars from time to time <laughs> only three or four times come on yeah yeah well in fairness <laughs> uh, you know credit where credit's due and so sure enough they find uh, a car in the swamp uh and and yank it out and the interior of the car is empty but then they open up the trunk and wouldn't you know it there is to me uh in the <laughs> trunk of this car and the police are like well sounds to me like norman bates is murdering people and throwing their cars in the swamp again yeah it's a little too matter of fact for me i'm uh, this scene is weird as well um more because of what happens before they find the car like uh, the police find um a suitcase first uh, they don't know whose suitcase it is, but they find a suitcase. They bring Norman out to the scene. They ask Norman, do you know who this might belong to? You know, he flips through it and then he finds the ashtray with the girl on it that we saw earlier in the film. That's when he says, oh, this is Mr. Toomey's um, uh, suitcase. And then after that whole conversation, the police actually just let him go. Like they let him go back home. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, he fired Toomey like two days ago. Now Toomey's missing, and we just found his suitcase in a in a you know a bog, you know behind the hotel. It's like, how do they let him leave that scene voluntarily like that? That that was a, another weird decision in, in my uh, you know in my eyes. Like I, I feel like that they. they uh, they could have maybe done a little something more, a little effective where they kept him there. And then when they pull up the car, you know, we get that shocked moment of, you know, uh, Norman's reaction. And maybe even we get a chase after that. Maybe he decides to flee the scene uh, to go back to the hotel. Again, I'm not a filmmaker. I don't know. I'm just saying that as I'm watching it, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm like, this doesn't seem realistic. Even in 83, if, if he is the main suspect in the disappearance of Toomey and we just found his suitcase in the place where Norman left the bodies and the cars and everything else all those years ago, how do you let him leave the scene? That was, that was an odd one. That left me scratching my head. Yeah, it's definitely not crack police work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's let our prime suspect just wander about what could possibly go wrong? 
Uh, but sure enough, as soon as they find this body, they're like, hey, we need to track down Norman Bates. Mary gets wind of this and runs back to the, the house uh, to tell him, like, hey, we got to go. They're coming back here to arrest you. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, where would we go? And then the phone rings. And <laughs> he's like, uh-huh. Yes, mother. Yes. What? Uh-huh. Why? Why would I do that? She's really nice, mother. And Mary runs upstairs uh, to listen in on, on the conversation. And nobody's there. And she's yeah. like, Norman, nobody's there. And... It's very clear that what mother is telling him is you need to kill the slut that's in my house. Mm -hmm. And Norman is like, well, I don't want to do that. Well, all right. If you say so. Yeah, I, I, I really like, I'm, I'm sure you saw in either one of the commentaries or behind the scenes, but I really, really enjoyed the fact that as the movie progressed, they more and more shot Mary from a high angle uh, right up until the point of this scene where she's standing in the, uh, in an arch doorway and the camera goes completely above her, just showing that, yeah, you're a little mouse in this big maze and you should get the hell out of here. Why she didn't make the decision to leave at that point is beyond me. I mean, you know, God bless her for trying to help Norman. I mean, obviously she saw something special in Norman that she could potentially help him keep his sanity. But at the same time, it's like, I'm sorry. Once you're talking to no one on the phone and calling them mother, I'm out. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) You're yeah. You're not wrong. I think if I were making the argument, I would probably say the reason she doesn't is because she does have feelings for him and also feels responsibility for what she has driven him to. Mm -hmm. you know that she was in on this and that's the reason he's cracking up and maybe she can make this one sort of last ditch effort to bring him back to sanity (laughs) by putting on his mother's clothes (laughs) and and grabbing a knife (laughs) you know and and so she runs up to him and she's like norman it's your mother hang up that phone right now if you can't be talking to your mother if i'm right here right Mm-hmm. And <laughs> then out comes Robert Loja, where <laughs> he's like, hey, what do you think you're doing to Norman? And she is clearly freaked out right now because she is in the presence of a murderer who is clearly gone cuckoo yet again. And <laughs> she turns around and just stabs Robert Loja in the heart. <laughs> and and that's it that like that's it for norman once this happens once he sees mother yeah uh you know over the dead corpse of his <laughs> his doctor that he's just like all right then i guess it's time <laughs> to kill nice um i really like this scene uh because as mary is stabbing um robert loja i i was fully fully expecting them to do a reprise of the tracking shot when uh you know the when the guy fell down the stairs in the original psycho fully fully expecting them to recreate that shot but instead loja falls over the banister and you know falls in a way that the knife gets pumped into his body i i that was a great way to subvert my expectation and i actually really appreciated it 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 ended up becoming one of my favorite kills in the movie because they didn't try to you know recreate yet another scene from the original and him hitting uh, the hilt of the knife hitting the banister and driving Mm. the (laughs) knife home is pretty gnarly that's a real ooh. Mm -hmm. oh yeah Oh, oh yeah that was an out loud oomph for me. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, ow. <laughs> it, yeah, it's pretty good. I I like the fact that this movie has a body count like it does. Like the, in the original Psycho, it's what two people, two people on screen. Yeah, yeah. and it, which is fine. I mean, again, it's 1960. It's a classic. It's a brilliant movie. But this time around, we've definitely got more people dying, and this one in. I, I think you're right. This one in particular, it's brutal, but it's not it's not over the top. Yeah, and it's not pandering, 
which yes. is most important for me. <laughs> yeah, all of those things are true. And so now that Norman has uh, just gone off his nut again, Mary is uh, trying to get free of him. And there's some real Christ imagery here. Oh, yeah. Where she stabs both of his palms as well as his side. Uh, so he is now bleeding from the Jesus places. Exactly. Yeah, he took that spiral spear to his side. Yeah. <laughs> and at one point he tries to grab the knife oh. that she's holding. And that's a really gnarly moment, too, where yeah. she pulls the knife out of his hands and leaves it uh, really bloody as well. Yeah, I mean, that uh, again, I, that kind of lends it, uh, a little bit of merit to uh, Norman's psychosis because I, I don't think too many normal people are going to grab a knife by the blade to try to disarm someone. That's a, definitely someone who either is completely mentally broken or who has no regard for their own health and safety. So I, I think it's A in this in this case. <laughs> yeah, and... And, and it, it also indicative of the fact he's just not feeling any real pain right now. He's, you know, he, he is sort of blinded by his madness to mm-hmm. everything going on around him. And they end up, he ends up kind of chasing her down into the fruit cellar where uh, she falls down and, and uh, shuffles the coal in in the coal pile and then there's her mother uh dead now mm-hmm. and so mary is then kind of driven to kill norman and is about to stab him but just in the nick of time jerry <laughs> the local federales show up and Gun Meg Tilly down like Sonny Corleone at at the toll booth. Uh, I I just, yeah. Uh, The convenience of this plot point is a little too much. I understand horror movies will always have convenient plot points, but they literally walk in at the exact perfect second. Literally, they walk in one second later, there's a knife in Norman's back. They literally walked in at the exact right moment. And I said the same thing as I'm watching it. I'm like, oh, that was a little too convenient, um, but whatever. And, and then the fact that, you know, I, I would imagine much like modern day police, you know, the police kind of make up their own narrative after that. After they've killed all the parties involved, they make up their own narrative and, you know, decide Norman's innocent. <laughs> Right, yeah, there's a whole scene where they have met the police station and they're getting him coffee and you need anything, Norman? You want you want a magazine mm-hmm. or something? We're, we've almost got you out of here. And, yeah. Yeah, and, and they're like, hey, we, you know, based on what we've learned, it's very clear that she killed your doctor. The fact is she, you know, she likely killed her mother as well, uh, as well as, you know, this kid that was in your cellar, like she and Lila were working together to drive you crazy and all. Mm-hmm. And you're free to go. <laughs> so sorry about all the trouble, Dormand. Um, <laughs> well, uh, hopefully uh, everything goes well with the motel. I know you're about to open that back up, so best of luck. Uh, and I guess, you know, give us a jingle if you need anything. <laughs> and and you're right. Like you said, they've, they've got their own narrative, which makes sense enough but also, it's really glossing over the fact that you're talking to a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have a few more questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a few dozen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so he goes back home. And this is where we have the shot of, as Norman is sitting in his kitchen, Mrs. Spool shows up, like, climbing the steps to the house. Uh, much as we've seen Norman do before. And she comes in to give us an exposition dump, which is, here's what's really going on. I'm your real mother. I was cuckoo also, and I gave you to my sister, who is Norma. And I was the one who killed everybody because I didn't want anybody screwing with you because you're my son. Yeah, a little... Ah, I, I know the movie is already almost two hours, but 
uh, again, I feel like they made a weird decision with this one. I, I would have preferred Norman finding out about Mrs. Spool on his own. Like maybe he has, you know, some theories of who his real mother might be. He does some research. Maybe his psychiatrist helps him out in the research. And then, you know, through his own efforts, he, he finds out, oh, this woman who I thought was my aunt is actually my sister. Not that he ever knew who Miss Spool was, but um, I, I don't know. I, I the, the fact that she just kind of shows up um, literally the day that he's, you know, released from the police station. I'm, I'm sure she's been watching carefully. So I'm not saying that it doesn't make sense that she's oh, that she shows up at this exact moment. What I'm saying is I don't like the decision by the filmmakers to actually have her just be like, hello, here I am. I'm your real mother. It's a, I don't know. Um, it's a little too underwhelming for me. Um, just like with the reveal of the plot uh, with uh, Lila and Mary, this reveal is a little underwhelming as well. Thankfully, it ends in a glorious way. <laughs> it is the absolute best. I mean, Anthony Perkins is just a treasure here mm -hmm. because he's so polite and, uh huh. Yes, mother. Uh huh. <laughs> Would you like something to eat? And as they're chatting he kind of circles around behind her grabs this shovel tees off and cracks her in the back of the skull with no fanfare it's a very it doesn't ask her like like can i get you something more to eat mm -hmm. and then whacks her in the back of the head and and the camera angle too the fact that it's a top-down shot I, I absolutely love this you know after she's hit we see Mrs. Spool on the on the ground going through her death rattle. You know, she's shaking on the ground. Norman basically just goes about the rest of his evening. He's whistling like he's in a good mood. We see him put dishes in the sink that were on the table. I mean, he's so comfortable with murder that, you know, at this point we are, we, we have our confirmation that Norman Bates is back. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so he picks her up takes her upstairs to mother's room there's the again the dialogue from uh his his mother in quotes yeah um telling him that you know what are you gonna do get out there and get that motel where what are we gonna do live on hope no mother we're not you know <laughs> like i love the fact that she immediately gives him shit and then it's like you know you know no one can love you like me norman yeah so, yep i i know one of the things I really love about this scene is once he kills Mrs. Spool, we actually see a recreation of some of the shots from the original, as opposed to that horrible remake where it was a shot for shot remake. Here, for the most part, we're not seeing a lot of the same shots uh, throughout the film. But then for this final scene, we're seeing, you know, the classic uh, top down shot on the stairs. We're seeing the classic shot of Norman carrying his mother into the into the bedroom and i really appreciated that it's like at no point did they try to jam down my throat that we're trying to recreate a hitchcock movie but then with that one last series of shots recreating shots from the original it's almost like a loving homage and i absolutely adored it i loved it yeah and and so the movie sort of ends with the vacancy sign coming on the Bates <laughs> motel to sort of suggest oh we're back where we all start yeah but that, that final image, though, with Mother in the window and him standing at the top of the stairs, so iconic. It's, I mean, that yeah. is just absolutely the perfect shot to, uh, this perfect shot to close out this film. I, I just love it. I, I would put, as a poster, I would put that on my wall. It's just such an iconic shot. And to think that it came from Psycho 2 and not, psych, not from the original. Even though, you know, obviously we, we do have some famous shots of Norman at the top of the stairs from the original. But this one in full color, and it's very obvious mothers in the window. Ah, I just love it. Yeah, it, it's terrific. And <laughs> the so th there's the story. So let's detour now to any specific performances that we want to shout out. And I, I think we just have to start with Anthony Perkins. Oh, yeah. Oh, by far. I mean, once again, he gives us an, an absolute... Uh, well, I don't want to say tour de force because he's he's not necessarily all over the emotional range in this film. Obviously, he's, you know, down and kind of brooding throughout the majority of it. But 
you know, we definitely see him kind of regain his smile as he gets closer and closer to basically square one, you know, where he started back in 1960. Um, yeah, another stellar performance from uh, from Perkins. Yeah, it it really is. You know, it's vulnerable at times. It's creepy at the end. It you know, it's it's just proof that he can kind of do it all, and and he's uh, just wonderful in it. Plus, uh, for being a whisper thin man in his fifties, uh, got some ropey muscles. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely, man. Those tall, lanky guys. You never go, you, know, you don't want to get into physical alterta- altercations with those guys. They have secret strength that you can't see on them. Yeah. yeah. N- not, not a good, uh, not a good look to get involved with uh, guys like that in any kind of physical way. But yeah, I, I actually, you know what, as I'm watching this film, I, there are times when I actually prefer his performance here than in the original. And it's mainly just because of the emotional range that he shows. Like, we don't really get sad Norman, uh, you know, mentally broken Norman. You know, we, we, we see a psycho who's very comfortable with being a psycho in the original. And here, the fact that he's showing, you know, all of this uh, disdain and um, sadness because he thinks he's falling back into his old ways. Oh, th- this this performance, man, I, I can't say enough good things about it. Yeah, it, it, there's a, a Shakespearean quality to it for being yes. this this guy who is just doomed. You know, he's no matter what he does, he's he's going to get it. Um, and all right, so let's talk about the other kind of lead of the film, which is Meg Tilly, who we haven't really talked about a ton in terms of performance. Mm-hmm. Um, which for me, there's kind of a reason for that. Like her role is, I like her well enough, but there are moments in the movie where when you're you know standing next to anthony perkins giving an incredible performance there are times when i'm like i don't know that you're 100 percent up to the task here oh definitely not i mean she she was not a name actress at this point i mean there were names thrown around like um meg ryan uh kathleen turner uh, that uh, Tom Holland and Richard Franklin wanted for this role. But then after a while, um, they kind of realized that it would be better to have someone not as distracting. And most famously, I think most people know, I'm sure you do, um, Jamie Lee Curtis was up for this role. And uh, Richard Franklin basically said, uh, you know, I would love to have her in this role, especially because she's part of the family. I mean, she is the daughter of Janet Lee, So it makes sense that she would play uh, Mary Samuels in this film, but um, I agree with what uh, the director said that she would be a little bit of a distraction. She's such a big name at this point, you know, coming off of Halloween and the fog and you know everything else that she's done up to '83. Um, I'm not sure if Trading Places would out, was out at this point uh, yet or not, but you know her star was definitely on the rise. Uh, it was very obvious she was trying to get out of the horror genre, so I'm sure maybe that didn't interest her too much. But I, I, I agree with the director's decision there. Get get a lesser known actress, one that's not going to be as distracting, you know, one that's not going to make us think of Michael Myers or you know, Fog Pirates. And yeah, I, I'm, you know, Meg Tilly is not ultimately like you know an amazing actress in my opinion i know she gave a spectacular performance in agnes of god um just a few years after this film uh but you know i've never been like necessarily impressed by her acting chops at least in a a consistent level from film to film she has her high points she has her low points this one is kind of a middle of the ground point to me i mean the story doesn't really call for her to have a tour de force style performance but i still feel that she gave us what we needed from the character because this is norman's story ultimately this is not mary's story and it's not lila's story it is norman's story so he should always be you know front uh, front and center uh, as far as the focus of the film and for whatever it's worth uh, like I said, having a no-name actress who is rather adorable, actually. I mean, honestly, I I, I haven't watched this film in easily over 10 years, and I, I had completely forgotten how absolutely adorable Meg Tilly is in this movie, both looks and attitude. I mean, she's, she's an absolute sweetheart, if not a slightly broken sweetheart. But yeah, 
Um, so ultimately, I'm going to say I'm okay with her performance. Uh, could another actress, like one of the actresses that I named, potentially have given us a better performance? Of course. But does that character need to give us another performance? I don't really think so. Yeah, and, and just to do a little bit of uh, homework here. Um, mm -hmm. So Jamie Lee Curtis... Uh, strangely, just a couple of years before this, had, was in Road Games, of course, uh, Richard Franklin's movie. Yep. And um, so she had done uh, the last of her horror movies with Halloween 2 in 81, had done Death of a Centerfold, that Dorothy Stratton movie, mm -hmm. which was uh, which was really well received, if I remember right. Yeah. And, and started to do some TV movie stuff. Uh, coming out of that trading places came out the same year as this so would have been in production about the same time okay that makes sense yeah. and but yeah so it was probably from her point of view like do another horror movie or do trading places which is a comedy with dan Aykroyd and eddie murphy two of the biggest stars oh yeah she absolutely made the right choice if yeah. it was between the two films oh yeah go go with the bigger hollywood movie i mean you know, even though Psycho uh, 2 still had a, like a $5 million budget, I mean, no one really looks at it as a, you know, giant theatrical film, like a, like a summer movie or anything like that, you know? Even though it came out June 3rd of 1983, no one really looks at Psycho 2 as a summer blockbuster as opposed to a Trading Places, which was an absolute critical and, um, you know, uh, fan hit. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um so a couple of other uh, Vera Miles I think is is fun in this. She's she's chewing some scenery. Oh yeah, and and I like that. I like to see Vera Miles just getting after it. Uh, it it's a good time. <laughs> um, and I again I can't. Anytime Robert Loja turns up in something, I'm a happy guy. I think he's he's one of those super reliable character actors that is just never bad. Yeah, yeah. And wasn't his very next movie after this Scarface? So, I mean, <laughs> the man had a great decade in the 80s. He did a lot of great films. I love his role in uh, in Scarface. Obviously, he plays a scumbag drug lord who's working with the police who, uh, you know, gets his comeuppance eventually. But I think that performance was so great. And, and I totally agree with you. Robert Loggia, great actor. Um, almost always a positive uh, when you see his name in the credits. Yeah, so, yeah, speaking of, listen to this run. So, yeah, he did Psycho 2, then he was in Curse of the Pink Panther after that. Uh, Same year, Psycho 2, Curse of the Pink Panther, Scarface. <laughs> then uh, in the in 84 was in Pritzy's, uh, sorry, 85, Pritzy's Honor, Jagged Edge. Wow. Um, is in eh, a couple of minor films uh, after that. And then Big is 88. Mm -hmm. uh and yeah i mean yeah, just... great, great decade for mr loja yeah i in i mean in even into the 90s he was doing big stuff and mm -hmm. just uh you know I, again just one of those character actors every time he shows up you know your movie has gotten better yep. um it, it <laughs> he is <laughs> he is the reincarnation of dick miller <laughs> yeah yeah like dick miller paul giamatti is like that yes. for me yeah you you throw pg in a movie uh, that's automatically a movie i'm more interested in mm -hmm. um yeah there, there's something to be uh, uh brian dennehy uh i yeah. can i can go hard on a brian dennehy and it's just it's again they're all character actors they are not mm -hmm. guys who are going to open a movie but you put them in your cast and your movie has has gotten substantially uh more interesting um, oh, yeah. Speaking of Dennis Franz, we, <laughs> we talked about him already, but one of the the best shit heels in a movie you're ever going to see. Yeah, I mean tailor made for those roles. I it just the look, his look, you know, his slightly overweight, disheveled look, it just always works for those types of characters. He's got a great voice. He can project when he's angry and yelling. Yeah, absolutely, a uh, great scumbag. <laughs> uh, yeah, those kind of bulldog. <laughs> bags under his eyes too yes. he just he like he always looks like he's coming off of a bender uh yeah he's a, he, and he's oily in this movie too like yeah the, yeah i i said he was greasy that's what i put in my notes <laughs> yeah he it, like he just looks like he's made of sweat and polyester 
exactly. Um, <laughs> any, anybody else you want to shout out? But I, those are the you know the the main cast there. But I don't want to sell anybody short. I honestly, I did like the sheriff. I thought that was a great little performance. Like I said, the fact that he could take uh, a lot of humor out of what had happened in the past and what was happening right now. Like he always had a great attitude. Obviously as the film goes deeper and deeper, uh, he, he gets more serious as the movie goes along. But um, yeah, a uh, Hugh Gillen. I mean, what a, what a great little performance. I, I found him incredibly entertaining, especially in the first half of the film. Yeah. Uh, also ironically in that uh, Dorothy Stratton movie with Jamie oh. Lee Curtis. So nice. well done, <laughs> Hugh Gillen. Uh, same year played sheriff on the a-team so if you get confused watching this movie that is in <laughs> fact the same sheriff as uh, the a-team awesome um <laughs> uh, yeah really good uh all right let's let's talk a little bit of thematic stuff here because mm -hmm. now that we've we've celebrated the performances um i here's the stuff i find really interesting about psycho 2 beyond you know it's got a fun story and all that stuff but i like the idea that the whole movie is in working to correct the wrong of Norman Bates being sane. Mm -hmm. You know, like you end Psycho, the original, with him good and crazy. You start this movie with him reasonably sane, or at least on his way towards mental health. And the, the entire movie is just saying, like, this is not how this is supposed to be. I was thinking that in all the scenes with Norman in the diner. Like, I don't know how you felt about it, but watching Norman Bates work a normal job felt very off-putting to me. You know what I mean? Like, he is a motel owner and manager. That That's the kind of what I expect and, you know, what I feel is his, you know, kind of his biggest uh, professional defining characteristic. To see him in a kitchen chopping up lettuce and onions and calling out orders, like every single one of those scenes, I'm just like, wow, why don't I feel comfortable here? Like something about this is just off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and you can almost chart the path of that. Like he, le he starts off in the diner. Well, that's not right. So he goes back to the motel. Well, okay. So now we're back to a little bit more of how the world ought to be. Mm -hmm. and then it's okay well he's he's there but he's also a good guy and he's saying oh okay so now we insert the lila and mary characters to start fucking with that as well as mrs spool and the more the closer he gets to losing his grip on what's real the more it feels like we're back in the first film not just in terms of well he's crazy again but like we were talking about the shots are mirrors of the original film mm -hmm. you know it's like this is how it's supposed to be yeah i mean that that whole final sequence is it's like comfort food for psycho fans <laughs> yeah and also seemingly the filmmaker sort of saying that is what norman bates is he cannot be rescued and mm -hmm. the only way that he is ever going to be truly happy is if he is running the motel with his mother that that is that's what he needs to be doing that is his lot mm -hmm. in life and and that's the real tragedy of it is that you know he starts off as a troubled but reasonably happy person and ends the movie happy as well but he's happy because all all the work has been undone all the the sanity is gone he is now completely mad and, mm -hmm. and I think that's really interesting. The other thing that we we touched on briefly is this idea of mothers and their children and the terrible influence that mothers exert over, oh, like, mm -hmm. using their children to pursue their own ends. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I definitely put Lila at the same level in this film as I would have Norma in her life, you know, before the events of 1960 I, I just feel like they're almost the exact same obviously with norma you know 
well, not that Norman was actually there telling Norman to kill people. Obviously, that was his perception. But then with Lila and Mary, we actually see that acted out, especially in the scene at the motel where we get the reveal. Like she's like physically grabbing Mary and basically telling her, oh, no, no, you're not walking away from this now. Oh, you know, while we're so close to completing this plan. So, yeah, that theme is very prevalent through both films. Yeah. Yeah, I I really that that was something that really hit me. Mm-hmm. I think uh, when I was watching it again, and you know, th- really thinking about it and doing my notes and so forth, and it was just like, oh, this is all, this is all about mothers. This entire, you know, maybe the franchise, but this movie in particular mm-hmm. is is about how every mother is terrible. And and ruins the lives of their children because they're trying to force their children to fulfill their wishes, to fulfill their desires. And yep. and as a result, it ruins the life of the children. And yeah, it's uh, it's sports dad living vicariously through his athlete son all over again, except in this case, instead of sports, it's murder. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and he, well, even with Lila you get, certainly get the impression that she's willing to go to extremes not just to put on this ruse of being the mother but could she kill maybe maybe oh I, she, I fully believed it yeah <laughs> you know if, if she thought it was gonna get norman landed back in in the giggle factory then by all means she'll do whatever she has to do to make sure that he's off the street and and gets her vengeance you know like you were pointing out earlier about uh, the, the wages of vengeance in this film are also quite high. Absolutely. Um, anything I'm leaving out? Any of the stuff that, you know, kind of subtextually was capturing your attention? Well, I mean, I brought up earlier the themes of forgiveness and the lack thereof, um, talking about how if Lila, I mean, maybe if Lila 20 years earlier would have maybe gotten some therapy, maybe if support groups were a thing, uh, maybe she would have been able to, you know, find some kind of forgiveness, at least enough forgiveness that she doesn't go around, you know, trying to convince people that they're insane. Because as I said at the beginning of the movie, Lila is the catalyst for this whole movie. It, it's not Norman's psychosis. Like, as we've already said, Norman seemed very close to a fully cured individual at the start of the film. And then just as people are fucking with him, you know, he starts to kind of break down. He starts to question his own reality, the reality around him, everything else. So, yeah, man, forgiveness. If Lila could have just found an ounce of forgiveness in her body, um, a lot more people would be alive in Fairvale or Fairview, California. I forget the name. Is it Fairvale or Fairview? In Fairview. View. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it just, you know, it, it feels like Lila is directly responsible for every death in this film. Um, I mean, you know, you could maybe take some of her responsibility away from the final kill of the movie, but, you know, everything else, yeah, directly on her. So. Lack of forgiveness, uh, you know, always finds a way to destroy the person who can't forgive. And, you know, that that hit me really hard this time as I was watching it. Um, Another theme that I actually hadn't thought about the first, like I said, 10 to 12 times that I've watched this film, but struck me really hard on this watch, especially after watching 2019's Joker, was uh, the lack of support for mental health, uh, for people with mental health issues. Um, Obviously, Joker is basically an allegory for um, the state not being able to help the people that need it the most. And early in this film, we actually get that line from Loja where he's like, you know, it's too bad that, you know, people are that we're losing doctors. People are leaving or getting let go. I forget exactly what he says, but yeah. Um, And right there, I'm like, holy shit, is that going to be a running theme here? And even though it wasn't like an ultra thick theme, like something that was very out in the open, as especially every time loja was on screen it's like i feel bad for him because he's trying really hard to help norman he legitimately is but because of whatever the state budget um you know uh, uh the way society in that local area thinks people with mental health issues are not able to get the help that they need and that theme is incredibly prevalent today we see it all the time i mean 
uh, you know, I live in Los Angeles, probably the homeless capital of the country, maybe the world, but easily the country. And I see it all the time. It's like these homeless people talking to themselves, um, you know, starting random arguments with people for no reason. It's like these are mental health issues um, out in the forefront. And these people can't get help for whatever reason. There's no funding for it, or they just, you know, they don't know how, they don't know what the steps would take, whatever the case may be. So yeah, that was a theme that struck me kind of hard on this one. I mean, am I reaching here? Or do, do you think there's some validity there? No, I don't think you're reaching at all. I think I, because yeah, I remember the, I don't remember exactly the wording of it, but yeah, you're right. There is a line that Loja has about like, you know, I'm glad I can help you. Mm -hmm. I wish there were more people that were in a position to you know to help people like you norman you know and yeah it, but i think that's an interesting extension of psycho because you know the mm -hmm. controversial ending of psycho of a, a therapist describing what's going on in norman's head but mm -hmm. I, it's interesting to me that the series has always had a strangely progressive view of mental health that you know, it's not just Norman is is crazy. You know, it's here is why he is the way he is. Here's why he's a psychotic. And here's how he, you know, recovered to some degree. But it was it was a precarious kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it, it 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 is interesting in that regard, I think, that um, of the, the first two films in the Psycho franchise, it has a surprisingly... Uh, modern by today's yeah. standards look at mental health exactly yeah um you know obviously be, you know with the first film taking place in 1960 and you know mental health maybe being a taboo topic that people didn't really talk about um when the film came out i don't know that mental health was like a big topic in the you know vernacular after the film came out but especially you know in 83 and then watching psycho 2 in 2021 it's it, it just it hit me really hard it probably helped um kind of the emotionality of my experience with this you know because i told you like this was the most emotional experience i've had with psycho 2 and obviously you know i'm i'm, I'm a 50 year old man now so i'm watching it for the first time in 10 years uh, the first time as a podcaster you know with my more critical eyes and yeah i i, I just i couldn't get over how down i felt with the movie to the point that the ending was almost refreshing for me. I mean, it's terrible. You know, it's, it's definitely some, uh, uh, shameful joy, but yeah, seeing Norman go back to doing what makes him happy actually kind of made me a little happy. Not to say that I'm happy people are, are dying. I'm happy that Norman is happy. Um, and you know, there, <laughs> yeah. there's kind of a, there, there's a catch 22 there. Cause for Norman to be happy, people have to die, but yeah, it, it was a weird one. It was a weird watch this time. That's for sure. Yeah, it. Well, yeah, you're you're right. It's almost like like there is happiness in the abandon of insanity. And exactly. Hey, uh, I mean, they say ignorance is bliss, so I can't imagine psychosis isn't bliss either. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's funny because I, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who worked in a uh, uh, like a, a elderly care facility. Mm -hmm. And I made the the comment about like oh I just the idea of of having um, your mind taken from you at at the the end of your life I mean what a nightmare and she was like mm -hmm. well not for them she was like <laughs> she was like honestly I mean it sounds terrible but they're among the happiest people you're ever going to meet because they're unburdened by the memories of regrets and things that they wish they did and never did or things that they did that they wish they hadn't do, done mm -hmm. you know that they're in a lot of ways they, they kind of have the joy of childhood all over again and that made me feel so much better like I'm not rooting for Alzheimer's or anything oh, no. <laughs> but at the, I was like oh yeah I guess that makes sense I always looked at it from the perspective of being you know, on the outside looking in, but if you're the person suffering from Alzheimer's and you're far enough along that you have forgotten all the, you know, you're, you're no longer aware enough to be prescient of the things that you've lost. And that yeah. just every day is kind of like, Oh, you just wake up and live this whole life that doesn't have any boundaries of time or memory or anything like that. You just exist. 
And that's yeah. a very zen way to live. And I suppose that that's kind of where we land with Norman Bates. He's sort of in that zen place of his mother is there to help guide him. And sure, maybe he's going to have to stash a body or two in the swamp. But, you know, such is life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let's let's move to our, our sort of final thoughts. And for me, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about has kind of come up already on my list of like the Dean Cundy camera work I think is great. Yep. Um, I, I, eh, you know, I said this earlier, but I'll, I'll probably just land on this and then turn it over to you. But the, the end of this still feels like a cheat to me. Like I like the mystery of who is manipulating Norman Bates, who is the real killer, but when Miss Spool just turns up, it's like, it was me all along. You know, it's sure. Agatha all along. Um, <laughs> I, that feels, it, it feels unearned, even though you've kind of introduced the character earlier on in the movie. Uh, that's just not enough for me. No, no, I, I 100% agree. Um, both with the actual content of the reveal and then the, like I said, the actual reveal, like how they reveal it to us. Like I, I've already voiced my opinion on that. I'm not real happy with Mrs. Spool just kind of showing up and pretty much giving us the rest of the exposition that was missing uh, from the film that pretty much explains the rest of the plot. It, it's a little too convenient. And honestly, Norman's reaction to it is probably the same reaction I had to it in my living room. Uh, I, I didn't like it, and I probably would have hit her with a shovel, too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> even even if you are my mother, I'm still going to brain you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that, yeah that, that's a bummer. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah i anyway. i mean I, I i don't hate the scene i just it's one of those things wh- that when you see a scene in your head that would have been better it's unfortunate because as i've said already three times i'm not a filmmaker and to for me to think that oh i could think up of a better way to you know to give us this reveal or a better way to wrap up uh the film blah 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 it it, it I don't know. It's almost sad. Like I said, like I, I, I am a fan of Richard Franklin and Tom Holland both. Um, but a few of the decisions made in this film, I don't know, felt a little self-serving or just convenient, um, which is something that I don't believe Hitchcock would ever do. You know, he, he does not go after the convenient endings or the 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 thinly veiled plot points, you know. Um, so to an extent, uh, these guys did do a service to Hitchcock and his memory Uh, But at the same time, during certain scenes, they kind of subvert what Hitchcock might have done in a particular situation. So you got to take the good with the bad with this film. And ultimately, for me, the good outweighs the bad. So I accept it. Yeah, I I think no greater wisdom has ever been put forth than you you do take the good and you take the bad and you take them both. And there you have the facts of life. (laughs) Oh man, I was such a huge fan of that show. I know every single word to that opening theme. I could sing it. I'm not going to, but I could. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, sometimes the world never seems to be living up to your dreams. Oh no. Uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, uh, one last thing uh, before yeah. we actually get into our ratings. Um, this this is another thing that I thought of. That again, it might be a reach, or it might be just the fact that. I am a gigantic Friday the 13th franchise fan. It is my favorite horror franchise. Fight me if you want to. I don't care. But um, when Mary puts on Norma's dress and wig, did you get kind of vibes of Ginny putting on Mrs. Voorhees sweater and trying to convince Jason that it was his mother? Like, that was the first thing I thought of when she did that. I don't know. Again, I might be reaching. No, no, no. A hundred percent. Like, I don't know that it was a direct reference to that, but it certainly feels like it because yeah, it, it, come on, Jason. Yeah. I mean, it, it is that <laughs> it's, it, you're pretending to be the mother of the villain. That is exactly what happens in Friday the 13th part two. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? You know, and then the, la- uh, the last little, uh, pi- the last little bit of trivia that I found kind of interesting and poignant was, uh, the painting. The painting uh, in Mother's bedroom that is covering up the wall. Uh, no, excuse me, the hole. The the painting that is covering the hole uh, into the bathroom. Uh, the painting that's covering it is actually called The Rape of Lucretia. And that is based on a stage play uh, from uh, uh, sometime in the 18th, or, uh, yeah, 19th century. 
and uh, it, obviously, hence the title, it's the story. Because in the picture, you can see a woman being attacked by two men. Um, I just thought that that was kind of uh, poignant, that that's the picture that was covering the hole. Because what is anyone going to do with that hole but nefarious things? You know, yeah. no one's going to do something good with that hole. And it's covered by the rape of Lucretia. So, yeah, I just found that interesting as well. Um, all right. Well, let's. Yeah, you're the. It, like this movie is not made without a lot of consideration it's just mm-hmm. some of it feels really clunky and and you, the, like that Joe De Sta- De Stefano script for the original Psycho is just so mm-hmm. elegant I mean it's just it's yeah. concise but it also and again you're in the hands of Alfred Hitchcock and you know being a, the, the master of show don't tell and yeah you know it like you just can't live up to that but also there are things in this movie that feels like you could have shored up and and made this mm-hmm. feel like a much more satisfying kind of story um, absolutely yeah all right so with that uh, aside cool. uh what about ratings on a scale of one to five half stars are allowed no quarter stars because we're not monsters here <laughs> uh where does this land for you oh man well i mean obviously both of us felt psycho was a five out of five no question even with its minor issues that we may have had with it it's an absolute masterpiece potentially one of hitchcock's greatest films uh an absolute cinematic achievement now obviously with this one um you know you're looking at a sequel 23 years later so obviously characters have aged mentalities have changed things like that um i you haven't said one word that I disagree with on this show. Ultimately, this movie is missing uh, the finesse of Hitchcock, you know, his his wonderful, suspenseful style that he, you know, pretty much made. I mean, how many directors have a genre named after him, you know? I mean, <laughs> right. there's there's Hitchcockian, uh, there's Lovecraftian, and uh, that's about it. <laughs> yeah, a Kafka-esque, I guess. Kafka-esque, would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, so, there's not a Franklinian description unfortunately (laughs) exactly so yeah so obviously going into it uh you know that you're not you know necessarily going to be watching a masterpiece though i am very happy that over the last 10 or so years uh the movie is getting more praise it's getting a broader audience like i'm hearing younger horror fans who maybe weren't even around in 83 who always said they had heard bad things about the film so they never watched it but then they finally watched it and they were actually fairly happy with it with you know which seems kind of the theme here it feels like we're both um more on the positive than the negative with this film um but obviously um the the things that we don't like are very glaring at times you know they're not always subtle um though there are some subtle things in there that i that i'm not a big fan of as well so I'm trying to justify my score because I am going to come in with a 3.5 out of 5. I really enjoy this movie. I really do. I mean, on a 10-point scale, that's a 7, which to me is, you know, well above average. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, uh, like I said, the things that bother me about the movie, I I sometimes just can't get past. I have to accept that this is not a Hitchcock movie. And, And that's sometimes as I'm watching the film, if I see Norman Bates on screen, it doesn't matter whether it's color or black and white. I subconsciously, I feel like I'm watching Hitchcock. And then when you see the decisions that are made throughout the film, it's, you know, it's almost like a slap in the face with a shovel that you're not watching Hitchcock. So, yeah, I I think I'm going to come in with a 3.5 out of 5 and say it's still very much worth watching, very much worth owning if you're a fan of the original. And, you know, as we said before, the good outweighs the bad. So I I would still recommend it. Yeah, it is. (laughs) <laughs> see this is why i like you 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 um i yeah i have the exact same rating i'm not gonna bury the lead three and a half stars for me as well um uh, for all the things that we've discussed for all the reasons uh that we you just stated um i would only add to that that you know it the performance from anthony perkins alone is worth the price of admission Mm-hmm. And whatever problems I have with the film, and I, and we do have some clearly, uh, it, it, boy, what a what a great performance! What a what a powerhouse turn from him! It's really good. It's nuanced. It, it he's doing stuff with the role. 
um, yeah, it's, you know, no masterpiece, but it, it's terrific. So, uh, yeah. all right. So before we wrap up, two things. Uh, first, uh, three things you may not know about Psycho 2. Ah. One I've mentioned already, which was that this was originally intended as a cable movie. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing, uh, which we didn't talk about, but you probably are aware of. When uh, Mary Samuels and Norman first go into Norman's mother's room, before they uh, turn the lights on, you can see <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock's silhouette against the wall on the right-hand side of the screen. It's funny because IMDb calls that an Easter egg, and it's like, well, wait a minute. If you have two working eyes, uh, you're not going to miss that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, but I, I think it's a nice little touch from the filmmakers to be like, let's kind of have him in the movie. You know, yeah, it's yeah. It, just like he cameoed, you know, in his own films. Let's have him cameo here as well. I really like. Uh, yeah, it's a nice homage. So, uh, you know, regardless, I, I, I am, I do have a positive opinion of it. I like it, so I'll take it. <laughs> and and the third and final thing that listeners may not know about Psycho Two is that in many ways this movie was a response to the fact that Robert Block, the writer of the original novel Psycho, had just come out with a novel called Psycho Two. And in an interesting parallel to the movie Scream, the movie is, uh, or the the novel is about them making a movie of Psycho 2, or of Psycho, and Norman Bates going to Hollywood to essentially lay waste to the production of Psycho 2, (laughs) and and was in many ways sort of a parody of the original Psycho film. Yeah, wow. That sounds like a Jay and Silent Bob movie. It, very similar. Yeah, and the, the, the idea was Universal was kind of pissed about this novel when it came out, and they wanted to get a, a Psycho 2 made that had nothing to do with that novel so they could kind of bury that as quickly as possible. Hmm. Uh, um, did you ever read that? I have not. I have not. I have not I need either. To. I'm, I, am, I, I would be very interested to see where Block took this story. You know, if he, if he took it to drastically different places than Franklin and Holland did. Very much so. And it seems like uh, also uh, Norman Bates dies off in Psycho 2. Oh, in the book? Really? Yeah. Wow. In in the yeah in the novel. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't read it, but I'm very interested to. I'm, I'm hoping to have time, you know, again, like we talked about once Halloween's over. <laughs> I should I should have actually a few minutes to spare, but uh, yeah, very interesting. So uh, before we get out of here, one last time, uh, please, please, please tell people where they can find more uh, from you because uh, I know I am a big fan of yours. You do nothing but make my life and show better. So thank you again for Absolutely. being here. Uh, thank you. And, yeah, and so where you. can people hear more? All right. Well, um, you know, uh, we listed them off earlier. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail because I think I did that on uh, the last episode. But you can hear me on No More Room in Hell. Uh, That's the main show. We have two side casts, uh, one being Fresh Cuts, where we look at the newest genre releases, and the other being Creature Comforts, where we look at nothing but creature features. Uh, In the Mic of Madness with the lovely Rebecca Reinhart will be back this month. Uh, We have already started planning the episode. Um, look for uh, a very interesting uh, we're basically doing a salute to 1981 um, but we're still in the planning stages on that Uh, should be out before Halloween so check that out Um, it's not horror okay is on hiatus for October as it is not a horror show and you know uh, all of us on that show are horror podcasters on other shows so we all just collectively decided we're taking the month off we will be back in november with uh, some movie i don't know which one obviously we haven't planned that yet on uh, uh let's see what else what am i missing underwater kaiju from outer space uh we just recorded an episode where we looked at gamera versus baragon and continue our episodic retrospective of the original ultraman series that was our first episode in almost a year um so you know we're very happy to be back uh, th- that's part of the reason that creature comforts was created you know kind of trying to fill a void that was left by underwater kaiju but now they're both active and going so as long as i can physically keep it going i will actually absolutely do it and that show is available on the legion podcast network all the other shows that i named are 
uh, available on the Dark Discussions podcast network, darkdiscussions.com. And then as far as guest spots this month, I have two guest spots on Cuts of the Chase. I have a guest spot on the Joe Blow Horror Show where we discuss Day of the Dead. Obviously, you folks know I have you know a couple of appearances now on the Dark Parade, which have been an absolute joy. And uh, let's see what else. Uh, Jacked Up Review Show. I did a guest spot recently where we did uh, just kind of a look at some of our favorite Mystery Science Theater episodes. Um, And then this coming weekend, I'm going to be doing a guest spot once again on the podcast Under the Stairs with Mr. Duncan McLeish. Uh, I am part of the Halloween retrospective that is currently going on on that channel. I will be there to discuss Rob Zombie's H2, a movie that I vehemently hated when I saw it in theaters. I have not watched it since then, so this will literally be a second watch for me. So let's see if time heals all wounds or if I hate the movie even more more which you know i'm leaning towards b honestly um and uh, i also have other guest spots available that are just slipping my mind right now you know i've got way too much on my plate but yeah i mean ultimately pick a podcast uh it's probably going to be a 25 percent chance that i'm on it (laughs) yeah i like those odds those are odds i like um yeah you're more machine than man at this point uh and and (laughs) <laughs> you know get some rest when all this is over take a take a nap yes i, I could use some sleep <laughs> all right uh thanks buddy we'll be right back to close the show thank you all right folks that is it for this episode of the dark parade i hope you enjoyed that conversation as did i i thought that was a tremendous amount of fun and thanks again to uh jerry uh be sure you are checking out all the stuff go to the facebook group and you will see the link to the post, and there you can find all of the the shows that Jerry does and links to that. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. He's a, a very, a very smart and very, very interesting cat to talk.